Great. Well, um, first I'd like to thank Melinda for including me in this panel. It's, um, it's an honor to be on the stage with uh, my colleagues and um, I'm sure that we'll have a good discussion afterward and thank you for attending. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of different projects um, that I'm involved with and how interestingly over the last year or so there's an um, everything's kind of coming together um, to be a very interesting space in this whole idea of um, metrics and evaluation and research representation and strategic goal making and all of those things that happen on the institutional and person level. Um, so I serve on the tracking and evaluation team for our Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute at Washington University. The Clinical and Translational Sciences Initiative is an effort funded by the National Institutes of Health to move science forward, to make it more efficient through efforts related to things like team science, um, collaboration, and a number of other things. Um, so that's kind of the perspective that I come from. Um, this biomedical realm is something I, uh, I spend a lot of time in, so I'll be speaking from that perspective. But certainly a lot of these concepts and ideas I think can be extrapolated to cover a number of other disciplines, um, and I'll talk about a few of those examples as well. So why measure? There's lots of reasons why we measure on the institutional or individual level, things like promotion and tenure or trying to understand um, you know, where we are with our um, scholarly prowess compared to our, um, our peer institutions. We're counting things like citations typically at that level, um, but there are a number of other things that you know, certainly we're talking about in this panel that was, uh, were covered in the panel earlier that should also be covered as well as a host of other things. Um, but I think that this quote um, from Wells and Whitworth really drives it home. You know, so it's no longer enough to measure what we can. The things that are easily countable, I mean, are they the things that we should really be counting? We need to understand what to measure and, and how we can measure what matters. So everyone here is very familiar with citation analysis. Obviously, it's been used for a long time to analyze documents and how they're used and reused. Um, but now we're looking at um, citations of data sets and other outputs. Um, we can also see things like use statistics, so things like project forks for, for software projects, um, downloads of slide share um, uh, presentations or views, um, certainly incorporation of, um, of a particular paper in a Mendeley library. And you, you know, when you think about some of these numbers, there's this assumption that if there's a high level of use or reuse around something, um, that that is going to be indicative of something significant happening. But what you know, we think about is do these numbers actually allow you to um, start to begin to pull together the information to tell something more meaningful. So Melinda mentioned earlier um, this REF um, initiative in the UK um, Research Excellence Framework where they're actually looking at pulling together these measures of, of scientific effort to become, um, to be able to look at impact on a more broad level. So we're looking at societal, economic impact, everything's very outcomes based. Uh, this paper that I've noted here was ac actually came out at the end of last year and it looks at some of these issues in this realm from the biomedical perspective. It's a fantastic paper. Um, in everyone's spare time, you should go take a look at it, read it, enjoy it. Uh, but they have 20 impact indicators from seven uh, categories and they discuss the strengths and limitations. And so the things that they're looking at here, these aren't the things that you're able to pull out of aggregate counts necessarily, but I do think that um, the publishing field has an important opportunity to be able to help people find that type of information, um, you know, or to be able to show people where they might look for this information. So the things that, um, that this particular paper talked about as being um, impactful outputs are things like developing uh, or delivering highly skilled people, R&D investment, um, sustainable development, cultural enrichment. I mean, how do you measure that? The only way you can measure something like cultural enrichment is actually to be able to, um, in a meaningful way, convey the impact of that particular effort um, you know, on whatever scholarly activity you're talking about. Something else, um, this is a project that I work on with Kathy Sarley. It's uh, in our, the Becker Medical Library. It's a library-based model for assessing research impact 
This has been motivated strongly by our work with our faculty um, on campus. So it's a hybrid model. So we actually use citation data to help to inform um, a lot of our work. Um, we track research outputs that have been disseminated and diffused. We track that dissemination. Uh, we look for indicators that demonstrate the evidence of research impact. We look at specific pathways, um, which you can see here. So it's things that um, everybody's interested, especially um, after the era funding in the United States, the stimulus funding, economic benefit, of course, community benefit. We want to see improved health of our communities, clinical implementation, advancement of knowledge. So there are a lot of different areas. Um, this model that we've put together is a do-it-yourself um, sort of approach. To, um, to be able to understand your, a, an investigator, um, a center, a university's contributions towards science. So um, what we've uh, made available through the model are reporting templates, glossaries of resources and terms to help people be able to speak the same language, examples of indicators and impact. We have, I think, 350 indicators right now <laughs> that can be used across a number of different sub-disciplines in biomedicine. Um, however, I did mention earlier, um, going outside of that particular realm, we're looking, um, we are hearing input from other disciplines in uh, nanotechnology, in earth and planetary science, in atmospheric research, where they've actually taken the Becker model and, um, and made those adjustments to be able to represent meaningful indicators in their own particular field. So, you know, it's, um, you know, it, it's an interesting approach. Um, so um, you're looking, as I mentioned, at the individual core or institution level. Um, and we try and provide guidance for quantifying and documenting research impact. Um, we provide um, consultation services for reporting this impact. And in fact, we provide services in our library um, for um, helping people report to NIH or um, to other funding agencies. So just last week, I helped with a very large center renewal, looking at bibliographic data and using that to help to show how that has been impactful um, you know, in the broader community. Um, we also have a number of strategies for enhancing the impact of research, and that actually tends to be a very popular class on campus. Um, here's the project website. I invite you to take a look. If you think of things um, or you're inspired um, to um, contribute, please let us know if something's missing. Um, we, this model is only as good as, um, you know, as what's available, and we make it freely available, um, and, you know, we are our goal is to make it a resource that's helpful to a broad variety of people. So the model basically um, takes some of the, this is a, I guess just a diagram to help us understand what's presented. We have a number of research processes and outputs. This is the font I realize is far too small for people to, un, to be able to see it. But we're looking at outputs, things like books, book chapters, presentation slides, figures, wikis, blogs, things like that. And then it's that diffusion of knowledge that allows you to be able to build on top of that. So then you're looking at what, what, do, what really matters. Like, why did I become a scientist? It wasn't to write papers that get highly cited. <laughs> like, that wasn't what I thought about when I was a little girl, was I hope I'm a very highly cited author. Um, it, I, what I wanted was to be able to make a contribution, to learn something new about the world around me. And so the things that we see as we diffuse and as we um, build new knowledge are things like um, new basic research studies, improved pharmaceuticals, um, clinical decision support tools, those kinds of things that are like meaningful outputs that can actually benefit the research process or health or, or whatever. So let's take this into um, something practical. These are the um, kinds of indicators of impact that we found for a particular research study on campus called the Ocular Hypertension Treatment Study. It was a study funded by the National Institutes of Health, and this goes far beyond citation analysis. We found things like educational materials, curriculum guidelines, new medical billing codes, um, uh, research studies, new grants, new criteria. There's an iPhone app. All of those things cannot be found readily found using citation analysis. But I'll tell you what, the citation analysis or things like use counts or whatever allow you to be able to say, 
there's something interesting happening here, you know, and it allows you to see which rabbit hole to jump down to be able to really find out what's happening. So um, there are a lot of issues. So my favorite thing to say about doing this kind of work is it's dirty, it's messy, it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> like, you need to know that this isn't something that you're going to do over your lunch hour um, for a research study, let's say. Um, so there's a significant lag between research discovery and translational applications, if we're thinking about translational medicine. Um, I mentioned uh, one question I asked in the earlier session today was about the temporal nature of this. It's impossible to know when you should start doing this kind of an assessment, so how many years do you let go by, and when do you stop measuring? Because some of this stuff is very, very interesting, um, you know, far down the road as, um, um, you know, as we heard earlier. So you can see that there are a number of different um, challenges. I talked about the work that we're doing in the um, Institute of Clinical and Translational Science. Again, we're trying to move basic research forward to result in improved human health. That's kind of the, the take home message there. Um, the evaluation uh, key function committee um, in the Clinical and Translational Science Award consortium institutions have put together 15 promising clinical um, processes and outcomes. And right now there's a process, or there's um, work being done right now to develop ontology extensions around this to help to uh, help institutions be able to report on this in a meaningful way. And that is being done by a work group in the informatics key function committee. Uh, I'd like to take a minute to talk a little bit about the value of the individual and the value of structured data. So this is where the realms kind of come together. I know probably everybody in here is aware of these research networking platforms. I'm not going to talk a lot about it. I work um, with Vivo, but there are several others. We're very excited. This is a very open data, open, linked open data process. Um, with open ontologies, and these ontologies are standard across a number of institutions. Um, institutions in the United States, in Europe, in Africa, in South America are using this ontology, and this allows for standardization across multiple sites, multiple types of organizations. What needs to happen? Um, so we see, we need to, um, in order to operationalize this and make it um, move forward, we're, we need to identify those indicators of impact to be able to integrate into those systems, operationalize them for the research networking systems. They've got to have screen space um, on that template. Um, the standards and best practices for research networking, um, so making sure that things are available in, um, as linked open data and working with the standard ontologies. The pressures that are coming from open access is certainly playing a role in some of the memos around um, open um, science, um, institutional desires and the things that are motivating them, and then trying to promote things like partnerships and, cross -geographic, uh, and crossing geographic boundaries. Um, so a lot of this work is being done under the DuraSpace, um, our partnership with DuraSpace as um, they're an incubator project under them. If anybody's interested in this, we do have a conference in St. Louis this summer. Um, there's workshops and um, discussions around that. And I just wanted to close with this slide because I think that this is probably very indicative of the field right now. So there's like a lot of interesting stuff happening above water, right? But I think that what's really interesting and where we're going to really see things um, you know, move forward very quickly over the next few years is what's happening underwater. And as we begin to standardize, develop ways of understanding provenance, um, it's an exciting time. So um, with that, I'll just acknowledge my um, partner in crime, Kathy Sarley, and then my colleagues at the various, um, my various affiliations. Thank you. <laughs>